Welcome to Lesson 10e, the Navier-Stokes Equation. In this lesson, we derive Cauchy's Equation, which is the General Differential Linear Momentum Equation. Then we discuss the stress tensor and the form it takes for a Newtonian fluid, which we'll define. Then we derive the famous Navier-Stokes Equation. In our textbook, we do three derivations of Cauchy's Equation. Fortunately, they all yield the same result or we'd be in trouble. Here I'll do only the easiest derivation, which is the one using Newton's second law. Consider a small fluid element of mass m. This fluid element is moving with the flow, so there's some velocity of the fluid or of the fluid element, v vector. This is a streamline which may be curved as shown, but must be tangent to the velocity vector. We sum all the forces on this element, and then the fluid element has to accelerate in the same direction as sigma f. The dimensions of our element are dx, dy, and dz. Newton's second law for this little fluid element is sigma f equal ma equal m dv dt, where this notation of capital dv dt is the material acceleration, which as you should recall from a previous lesson, is the acceleration following a fluid particle. Here it's this acceleration as we follow this fluid particle. The mass is the density times the volume. So Newton's law is written like this, which we'll call equation one, for our little fluid element. Well, what is sigma f? It's the sum of all forces acting on the fluid element. As we did previously with control volumes, sigma f is the sum of all body forces plus surface forces. Body forces are simple, since we'll consider only the gravity force. Let's consider our little fluid element of dimensions dx, dy, and dz, and we'll typically let vector g act in the minus z direction. So the body force on our little fluid element is just the weight of the fluid element, which is rho g times the volume dx, dy, dz. The surface forces are a little trickier to calculate. They consist of pressure and viscous forces. I'll refer you to the text for the derivation. It turns out that sigma f surface is the dot product of the gradient vector and the stress tensor, sigma ij, times the volume of the fluid element. Sigma ij is the stress tensor, and this is a dot product, the dot product of the gradient vector with a second order tensor yields a vector which is consistent with our equation, since sigma f surface is also a vector. We'll look at this stress tensor in a moment. For now, I want to combine the body forces and the surface forces and plug them into equation one. So the sum of these two forces will equal this right-hand side. I'll write that out here. We write sigma f is the sum of all the body forces plus the sum of all the surface forces and that equals rho dx dy dz times the material acceleration. Let's take this portion of the equation and notice that dx dy dz appears in all three terms, so we can cancel it out. People in fluid mechanics like to put the acceleration term on the left side, so we have rho dv dt equal rho g plus del dot sigma ij. This is called Cauchy's equation, which is valid for any kind of fluid. What distinguishes one fluid from another is the stress tensor. The stress tensor itself is made up of normal stresses and shear stresses. Cauchy's equation by itself is not very useful until we can get an expression for sigma ij. So the goal is to write sigma ij in terms of primary variables in the problem, like velocity, pressure, viscosity, density, we already have density in the equation, but we need to get sigma ij in terms of these other variables in order to make Cauchy's equation useful. Sigma ij itself depends on the type of fluid, which leads me to a discussion of the different types of fluids. We repeat Cauchy's equation here. Rho dv dt, the material acceleration, is rho g plus del dot sigma ij, the stress tensor. dv dt itself the material acceleration can be expanded like this as we saw in a previous lesson. And as I said, the stress tensor sigma ij needs to be written 
in terms of our other variables so that Cauchy's equation becomes useful. Equations that relate stress tensor sigma ij to other variables in the problem are called constitutive equations. These constitutive equations depend on the type of fluid. I show here four common types of fluid. In this plot, we plot shear stress as a function of shear strain rate. Students should recall the strain rate tensor, which we discussed in a previous lesson and called epsilon ij. Remember that it was a nine component tensor or a second order tensor. The shear strain rates are the off diagonal components of this strain rate tensor. Now let's look at these four different kinds of fluids. A shear thickening fluid is one where shear stress increases more rapidly as the shear strain rate increases. So the curve tilts up like this. It's not linear. A shear thinning fluid has the opposite behavior where shear stress increases more slowly as shear strain rate increases. A Bingham plastic is linear, but it starts at a non-zero shear stress. This is called a yield stress, so the fluid doesn't move until you reach this yield stress. A good example is toothpaste. For Newtonian fluids, the shear stress is linearly proportional to the strain rate tensor, and it starts at the origin. Here are some examples of Newtonian fluids, water, air, oil, gasoline, and many other common fluids, both liquids and gases. Here are some examples of non-Newtonian fluids, paint, which is shear thinning or pseudoplastic. It's viscous enough to stick to the brush because the applied shear stress is small. But its viscosity drops dramatically as it's sheared, so we can apply it to a wall in a thin coating. Toothpaste, which as I mentioned is Bingham plastic, and quicksand, which is shear thickening, also called dilatant. You can make a shear thickening fluid like a quicksand by mixing water and cornstarch. You may have seen videos of people running across water that's actually a mixture of water and cornstarch, a shear thickening fluid. You can even hammer a shear thickening fluid. We consider only Newtonian fluids in this course. So what is a Newtonian fluid? I won't go through the derivation. It turns out that the stress tensor, which is a second order tensor with nine components, has two parts. Pressure, which appears only in the diagonal terms, and is negative because pressure always acts inward. And then nine components of the viscous stresses, where there are even viscous stresses in the normal components, and then there are shear stresses. As we saw with the strain rate tensor, this tensor is symmetric. These two terms are equal. This term is equal to this term, and these two terms are equal. With this equation for the stress tensor, we have achieved our goal of writing sigma ij in terms of pressure, velocity components uv and w, and fluid property mu. Finally, we can derive the Navier-Stokes equation. We plug this expression for sigma ij into Cauchy's equation, and we get the famous Navier-Stokes equation. There's a compressible form, but here's the incompressible form. In vector form, the stress tensor gets split up into the gradient of pressure, and then this Laplacian term with viscosity. The Navier-Stokes equation is the most famous equation in all of fluid mechanics. To actually solve fluid flow problems, we also need the continuity equation. And since this Navier-Stokes equation is a vector equation, we typically split it into three components to actually solve fluid flow problems. In Cartesian coordinates, we have the continuity equation, as we saw in a previous lesson. This is the incompressible form of the continuity equation, which is what we'll use in this course. And here are the three components of the Navier-Stokes equation, the x component, the y component, and the z component. Here we make provision for gravity to be in any direction but normally we have gravity in the minus z direction. These equations are valid when the flow is incompressible and the fluid must be a Newtonian fluid. If we could solve these equations, we could find solutions for all kinds of flows. But as you can see, these equations are rather complicated and very difficult to solve. In upcoming lessons, I'll show you how we can use these equations to solve some simple flow fields that anything more complicated will require computational fluid dynamics. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.